you could sit in a chair you normally don't sit in. Amen? Maybe pray for the chair for the next person to have your anointing. Some of you think, well, you don't want my anointing. Maybe not. We want to talk about, we're talking about the battle, fight our battle. And I pray this morning that what I share with you will equip you to fight your battle. I believe with all my heart, you know, I, I talk about this quite often because I want you to know that, first of all, this is not a cookie-cut church. I want you to know that we're led by the Holy Ghost. We're led by God. We want to do what God tells us to do. We're not after what man thinks. We want to know exactly what God wants. Amen? And so many times as I'm preparing for the message, I feel like during the week, God will drop a little nugget in my spirit, and I'll write it down, and boy, I'll begin to kind of dissect it. And, but the whole time, it seems like to me, I don't know what direction it's going to go. At the end of the week, when I finally compile all of my notes and start researching and start praying and just really asking for direction, God begins to kind of like an onion, begin to unpeel all those things. And so this morning, as I talked about just a minute ago, how we all have a battle to fight, I believe the number one thing that you need to fight your battle is what I'm about to give you today. I want to talk about word power, the power of God's word. It's powerful. It's mighty. It's great. I remember as a young man, this old missionary came to our church, and he shared this story about how he was going to the tribes down in the heart of Mexico, in the mountains of Mexico. And he was going to places and going to tribes and seeing people that were what we consider the unreached group that some people have never been before. And as he went, he began to hear a story. And he told us the story. And the story was about this old Mexican man who was one to the Lord, who was given a small New Testament Bible. And this old man consumed this Bible and treated this Bible with great respect, but began to understand the power of the written word. See, God shows us who he is through his word. And when we understand that when we speak and read and to begin to digest we digest in the power of God through his word. And he talked about how he, he went to all these places. And this old man who had been once to the Lord years ago, who didn't even have shoes, he said he had old denim jeans that he put on his feet and he wrapped it with leather so he could climb through the mountains so he wouldn't cut his feet all up. But every time he would go to a tribe, he would win them to the Lord, and he would tear one page of that little Bible out of his book, and he would give to the chief of that tribe. Years later, when this missionary was going into these tribes where, where most men had never been before, he was finding that some of these tribes were won to the Lord by this old Indian Mexican man. And each one of them would hold up this raggedy little piece of paper that most of the people, probably 100% of the people in the village had read a thousand times. And he understood the power of God's Word. If you can just get a hold of just a little bit of it, it would change your life. Now, I saw a movie years ago I'm not recommending it to nobody. It has a lot of violence in it. But it was a movie about the book of Eli. And if you saw this movie, the concept of the movie, which I'm about to ruin the movie for you, so, I, you know, you might as well not see it anyway. The guy was blind, but he consumed the word because during this time, this, this horrible time they were going through, they didn't have any more Bibles. And this guy understood the power of the written Bible, the written word. And even the evil man tried to do everything in his power to get this Bible because he understood 
the power. Now, he was manipulating it as a spiritual manipulation. He was going to try to use it against the people. But this guy understood the power of the word. And when he finally got to his location, he dictated the word. And you found out at that moment he was blind. And they wrote the word. And they preserved the word. And the word became powerful. Now, I'm telling you all these things because we have to see from the very beginning what God did. Now, we know the scripture, and many of us can quote it, but in Genesis 1, we find where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Now, for me, when I read that, I realized that in my life, there was an emptiness, there was a void, lack of form, because I didn't have God's Word in my life. And the day I received God's Word, things begin to form in the right way. Now, when I read this, he says here, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3, then God said, See, he spoke the word. The word that he spoke, he spoke everything into existence. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty powerful. That's powerful. When you begin to understand how God used his word to speak into existence. Now, what we have today, as we reference the Bible, many of you heard me talk about this before. The Bible, as theologians, talked about the canon of Scripture. They talked about the canon of Scripture. It had to have three things. One, it had to be written by a prophet. Two, written by a prophet inspired by God. And three, it had to be timeless. What does that mean, Pastor? That the word that was spoken thousands of years ago is the same word that we have today, is the same word that's applicable to our lives here in the year 2018 as it was 2,000 years ago. Now, I don't know about you, but just thinking about that blows my mind. Now, if you're a reader, you'll know that you can read books that were written 10, 20, 30 years ago that's antiquated and outdated. Come on, somebody. But the Bible, the Word of God that was written thousands of years ago, it's not antiquated and it's not outdated because that's called the power of the Word. Now, I want to look here, and we're going to go through some of these things because I want you to see. Now, if I went through all the, the passages we talked about the Word, we'd be here for a long time. But I want to pull out some ones that I think are pretty important that we pull out of King David, the greatest rapper of all, KD. Come on, somebody. Psalms 1830. It says, For God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He's a shield to all who trust in him. Now, I'm going to say this, and, and, and if you don't know me, and you take this wrong, then you don't know who I really am, because I'm not saying it in a cocky, uh, a disrespectful way. But I believe... After all these years, I'm getting old to the point where I'm going to tell you this. In my life, without a doubt, God's Word has been proven. Come on, somebody. If you've been around for any length of time, you'll know without a doubt that God's Word is proven. What He said He was going to do and what He's done, listen, God's Word is proven. It's been a shield in my life. Every time I turn around, every time I'm faced with something. And listen, what's so amazing is how we can change our lives by the spoken word. Somebody can walk into your day, and you can have a horrible day, and they can tell you something and radically change either your day, your week, or your life. Come on. That's how powerful the word is. And so for myself, every time I think about the Word and every time I realize I'm going through something difficult, listen, as much as I read God's Word, when somebody comes alongside of me, when I'm going through something difficult and they quote God's Word, it changes my life. You're going through something, all of a sudden somebody says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread. You might have read that a thousand times, but all of a sudden that Word just jumps out. Because God knows exactly what you need. And see, when people tell me, well, God don't ever show up in my life, it's because you never open your word. Come on, somebody. Because every time I open my word, God shows up. 
Every time I begin to read the Word of God, God shows up. Every time I look and I hear the Word of God, God shows up. Don't tell me God is not showing up today in the year 2018. You're not reading your Word. Because God's Word is for us. It's powerful. One place it reads, another place it says, For the Word of the Lord is right, and all His work is done in truth. He loves righteousness. Another place it says, The Lord gave the Word. Great was the company of those who proclaimed it. Here's the problem. We want the Word, but we don't want to proclaim the Word. To proclaim means to declare it with an importance. To see it as it is and the importance that it is. Now, you can read the Word and not proclaim it. You can see the Word and not receive it. When God speaks to us, listen, when I read my Word, one of the first things I pray is, God, allow your Word to become life to me. God, allow your word to be just revealed to me. Every time I read it, I begin to see God's word spoken, sometimes totally different. It's fresh. It's new. It's refreshing. It's great. It's wonderful. If you begin to say, God, give me your word today, God will not deny himself, and his word will never return void. Even though you might think sometimes it might be a little strange. And there have been times in my life where somebody said something to me that I thought, eh, a little strange. That's weird. But you know what? God's word is never void. Now, let's look at a couple places here. 107 or 105, it says... He remembers his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations. That's for us today. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. That's a powerful word. He says, I will meditate on your statue. Remember the word of your servants. And he goes on to say, your word has given me life. God's word gives us life. There are people today, as he spoke in the very beginning, without void, empty. And God's word, when spoken begins to change the dynamics of their whole life, if they let them. He goes on to say, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. He goes on to say, you are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Uphold me according to your word that I may live. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. See, when we find God's word, we find great treasure. We find great hope. We find everything that we stand in need of. He says, give me understanding according to your word. One place is, my tongue shall speak of your word for all your commandments are righteousness. I love that. Your hand became my help for I have chosen your precepts. I have chosen what you have said. Then he goes on to his son, King Solomon, who writes, he who despises the word will be destroyed. See, whenever you begin to deny God's word and you despise God's word, he says you're going to be destroyed. Now, that's not me saying that. That's the word saying that. I'm telling you, the, the, the moment we realize how much validity the word has, it will begin to rock your life. He says in another place, he says, and a word spoken... In due season, how good it is. Now, let me read that the other one. I didn't finish it. It says, he who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandments will be rewarded. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Then he goes on to say, he who heeds the word wisely will find good. And whoever trusts in the Lord, happy, 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 happy is he. Amen. Happy, happy, happy. I'm on Duck Dynasty. Happy, happy, happy. Amen? Look, when you get God's Word in your life and you begin to allow it to run your life, you become happy, happy, happy. Amen? Now, in the New Testament, we find almost the same thing he says in the Old Testament in John. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word 
was God. And that's interesting, amen? God's Word is it's who He is. He was in the beginning, was God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. See, what's really interesting is we give Satan more credit than he deserves. Because the truth is, Satan has not and cannot invent anything. Only thing he does is he takes God's Word and he perverts it. Come on. Because see, by spiritual manipulation, he can begin to pervert God's Word and begin to, did God really say that? And you know what that does? That begins to draw a doubt in our lives, and we begin to doubt God's Word. Amen? Let's look here. He goes on to say, uh, And the Word became flesh, and it dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Isn't that wonderful? The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Christ is the Word. Amen? He's the Word. He's the only way, the truth, the life. Everything we need is in Christ, who is the Word. Listen, this morning, as I probably on every Sunday morning, I am so passionate about this because I believe with all my heart, with the amount of people that we have in this room alone, that if we really take this word and apply it to our lives, our families will be radically changed. Our lives will begin to change. And those people that God puts in our life will begin to change. Because when people see the word of God working in you, then they'll want what you got. Look, I remember one time when my vehicle wasn't running well and somebody turned me on to seafoam. Uh, I think that's how you say it. Is it seafoam, the stuff you pour in your gas? Am I saying it right? Thank you, some of you mechanics. Some of the other guys are like, I don't know, just put gas in it. <laughs> but I remember putting seafoam in the gas and mixing it, and all of a sudden, the problem that I was having with my engine went away. And it began to run better than it ever ran before. Now, I'm telling you today, if you put a little seafoam, a little word up in your tank, come on, somebody, then you'll begin to run better than you ever ran before. You'll begin to do things you've never done before. I'm telling you this morning, we have to apply those words in our life if we want to change them. If we don't, then you'll spit and sputter, amen? Hebrews says this about the Word. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It goes on to talk about how it pierces, how to discern it. And he goes on to the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creation hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Look, God's Word will cut you up, brother. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where perhaps I'm not doing what I should do, and somebody that I hold that maybe I want to be accountable to, one of my presbyters or whatever, they'll say something with the word, and I guarantee you, if I'm not doing what's right, that word will pierce my heart. That word will cut me deep. And at that point, I can either be excited and change or be mad and leave. Amen? And see, that's what happens to most people. All of a sudden, they just get mad at something and they leave because the Word didn't line up with whatever they wanted. Now, let's look at some things here because I want you to see this is one of my favorite. This is Old Testament here, Proverbs 18, 21, one we probably quoted a thousand times. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, I repeat that because I want to make sure that's understood. Listen, what we say, if it's good, then we're going to eat the fruit of it. If it's bad, we're going to eat the fruit of it. Come on. There's life and death in the power of the tongue. What we say can either help somebody or hurt somebody. We can say things that's going to change their life for the good or say something that's going to destroy them in their life. That's why I'm so, man, as a pastor, I generally don't step in 
But if I see a parent telling their kids, you're stupid, you're never going to amount to nothing, man, that will stir me up, brother. Why? Because, listen, when, you want, when they wind up not doing right, they're not doing it because you spoke it into their lives. Look, I tell people all the time, my boys, I spoke life into them. Every opportunity I was given, I spoke life into them. Why? Because I wanted them to have the word of life to change them because there's life and there's death in our tongue. I'm, I was laughing because, uh, as you know, we, you showed up this morning and you seen the auditorium in a different shape. We had a wedding yesterday. And I had the opportunity to do a wedding for a young man that's been in my church forever, since he was a little boy. I mean, he cut his teeth on, on the pews of our church or the chairs of our church. And I remember this so funny because when he was about eight years old, we had built a gymnasium over the old church. And we had back in that time when, when the spouse was deployed, we had what we call the Mother's Day Out. And so we would take the kids and allow the mothers for a couple hours to go and Man, they would go and get their hair done. Some of them would go home and sleep, amen? But we'd give them an opportunity to go do what they wanted to do, and we would watch their kids. And this particular time, we had Dory and Kevin's kids. Kevin was overseas, and Dory, you know, had 462 kids, amen? <laughs> Just five. Seemed, seemed like a lot more, amen? But he was eight years old, and he was in the gymnasium. And my son, Kobe, was a little older, but he's got a bad reputation of hurting people during this time they were playing, and he hit his head. Now, those who don't know Kobe, Kobe has a reputation of, of hurting people or having head damage for other people. When we were in seminary, we went to school with the, uh, the Jonas brothers. Jonas brothers' father and I were in school together. So my kids played with the Jonas brothers, and Kevin Jonas got his head busted because Kobe pushed him. So Kobe's known to fame as pushing Kevin Jonas. Amen? But all of a sudden, we get a call... And Scott, his head is busted wide open, and we can't find Dory. And so I show up, and the girl who's taking care of him says, man, it looks like he's going to need stitches. And he knew what stitches was. And so immediately he's like, no, I don't want stitches, no. I mean, he's just panicking. He's screaming. So I looked, and I said, son, pastor's not going to allow them to give you stitches. We're going to give you sutures. Come on, somebody. I'm telling this power in the word, amen? And so he was like, okay, pastor said, I ain't getting no stuff. I mean, he was bleeding all over the place. So we get him to the hospital, and Dr. Granger, which I reminded this story because I just recently saw Dr. Granger, and I was talking to him about this. But it was so funny because Dr. Granger comes in, and he sees him, and immediately he says, man, that boy's going to need some stitches. No! My pastor said, I don't have to have stitches. I said, Doc, you ain't going to do stitches on that boy. Give him some sutures. Doc's like, okay, we'll take care of that. We gave him sutures. He was fine. He was fine. You know why? Because there's power in the Word. In his mind, sutures was not near as bad as stitches. And I'm telling you today, sometimes it's not how we say it, but what we say, amen, or vice versa. But it's the power of the tongue, the power of our Word. And so for a moment this morning, I'm going to try my best, if I can, to interpret to you what I believe will help you and change your life. And this is what I want to say to you. I want to say, how can we or how should we treat God's Word to give us so we can have the power of the Word and be victorious in His Word? How do we treat God's Word? What should we do? Here's the first thing. The first thing we should do is we should worship the Word. Come on. We should worship it because, listen, whatever you worship, Whatever you put first in your life, you worship. I believe with all my heart, we need to know without a doubt the importance of God's Word. If you don't see the importance of God's Word, then you're going to starve yourself and you're going to struggle. I'm telling you this morning, we have to see it in such a way that allows it to change our life, the importance, the value. This morning, if I ask you a question, and I said to you, your house is on fire, Everything in it is going to be destroyed. And you've got the opportunity to go get one thing out of your house. What would you get? 
Well, I will tell you, whatever you get is what you worship. Some of you might say, well, it's my best rod and reels in there. Come on. Or my best guns in there. Come on. Or maybe a lady might say, well, I want to get my wedding pictures. I want to get my kids' pictures. I want to... You know, those are not bad things. But I'm telling you this morning, you've got to put your priorities in line. And by understanding the power of God's Word, it's when I say worship it, I mean you've got to put it first. Jeremiah talked about this in one place, and he said this. He said, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gates of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word. And he said, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judea. Judea, which is which worship, who entered in the gates to worship the Lord. Another place he talks about, he says, uh, Judea came to worship the Lord's house, in the Lord's house, all the words that I command you to speak. I'm telling you today, we have to learn to put God's word first. Now, also, I reference what I call in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we find a place, and the more I read this passage, the more I can see how it can apply to a lot of things in our life. But here we find a place when he says, he calls them, he says, Oh, ye of little faith. Then he says this, Therefore, do not worry. Do not be concerned. Do not let it overwhelm you, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all, these things the Gentiles seek. When you read this, he's talking about even the world seeks after these things. Now, he's talking to the body of Christ. He's talking to believers. He's talking to you and I who understand that he is there for us. Understanding that God himself is there in your corner. He is your king. He's your master. He's your Lord. And he says this. He said, don't worry about all these things. He said, the world worries about all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But this is what he says to us. But seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, seek his word. Seek his will. Seek what he has for you. Don't worry about it. Listen, you begin to worship his word by seeking his word. Amen? You seek after what he says here. He says, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In all these things, what things? All these things. What things? All the things? What things? All things. Why? Because he told us earlier, don't worry about what you wear. Don't worry about what you eat. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. He's trying to give us an example that, you know what? You worry about things you shouldn't worry about. The thing that you should worry about is me and what I have for you. And what I have for you are great things because that's what his word says. He says, the plans I have for you are good. I mean, all these places he says these things. And he goes on to say, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day, it's its own trouble. Listen, when we understand the significance and the power and the value of the word of God, you will put it first in your life. Now, again, I will tell you, sometimes the word can, without being disrespectful, sometimes... In our carnal minds, it could be weird. Why? Go back and read it. I mean, a donkey spoke. That's pretty heavy, amen? I mean, you read those things, but you know what? God wrote them for a reason because he's trying to show us if he can use a donkey, he can use any one of us, amen? Another place, he says, the guy was using an axe. And as he's chopping wood, the axe flew into the water. And the axe he had, which during this time... Those tools were very valuable. And the axe flew in the water. And so the prophet walks up to the water, speaks to the axe, come on, and the axe swims back to shore. Now, that's pretty weird, amen? But you know what? As weird as it gets, I believe it. Why? Because we're a little weird too. Come on, somebody. Come on. If you're not strange, you're fooling yourself, amen? We're all different. But guess what? We're made in the image of God. If you believe it, then you begin to celebrate it. Then you begin to celebrate. You know what? When people make fun of us, we should shout. Oh, y'all didn't like that one. Oh, boy, make fun of me. I won't be like everybody else. Listen, I'm telling you, God's word sometimes can be a little different. But 
it opens our eyes because we see it. Because with the anointing, which is Christ, is the anointed one, it brings understanding. See, without the anointing, there's no understanding of the Word. Every time I read the Word, I pray, God, give me the anointing to understand it. Now, I will tell you today, you know, I, I like King James. I grew up on King James. I read a lot of the new King James. But there are a lot of times when I'll read over into the message, I'll read over into the living, I'll read over into other things. Why? Because I want it to be broken down so my little simple mind can comprehend it because I don't want to walk away from there. All I get was thou shouldest not do this or that or whatever. If I don't understand it, I want to ask God for his anointing to open my eyes so I can read it in a way. When somebody just recently texted me and asked me about different Bibles, you know, again, I grew up on the King James. I love the King James. All my commentaries are from King James. But you know what? If the message reads better than you understand it, then I'm, I'm cool with that. Why? Because God's Word would never return void. And we have to come to a place where we say, God, open my eyes so I can understand. And the more that we worship it, the more that God will open it to us. Now, here's another thing here. If we're going to begin to understand and treat God's Word in such a way that we receive the power of the Word, we have to overcome offenses. Now, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, let's go back and look here. Here's a guy who's traveled with Christ the whole time. And the whole time he traveled with Christ, Christ told him what he came for. I come, I'm going to be a sacrifice, they're going to take me, they're going to sacrifice me, but don't worry. On the third day, I'm going to rise again. Now, for some strange reason, Peter didn't like that. Peter began to be offended by that. Because here, let's read it. Over in Matthew 16, it says, For the time Je From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. You know why? Because he was offended by what he was saying. He rebuked him saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Now, at this point, Jesus realizes that he's making this more about him than about the Lord. Come on. He's offended by the word because of what's about to happen, because he's fixing to lose his gravy train. Come on. He's fixing to, Jesus is fixing to be gone, and, and all these guys depending on Jesus for all their livelihood. Now, here's what he says. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense. You're an offense. See, so many times we read the Word, and instead of letting the Word change us, we become offended by the Word. We become offended because the Bible says, very plainly, it says, in the last days, which I believe we're seeing now, in the last days, people will, they will they have, have itching ears. They will have teachers to, to tell them really what they want to hear. Why? Because they offend it by what the Word says. See, as a body of Christ, if we're going to walk in the power of God's Word, then we can't be offended by God's Word. We got to say, okay, God, you said it. I have to believe it. I'm going to trust it. Because, see, many times when we read something and it don't line up with our lifestyle, come on. See, I could sit here today, and some preachers do, and they stand in the pulpit, and all they do is preach about certain sins. And they call them out. Well, it's a sin to do this, and a sin to do that, and a sin to do this. And I'm not saying they're not sins, but I'm a big believer that that's the Holy Ghost's problem. That's, a, that's the, the J-O-B of the H-G. Come on, somebody. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is a leader and guider of truth. The Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit convicts you through his word, then your life will be changed. If you're only convicted by what I say, when I'm not around, you won't be changed. Come on, somebody. I mean, if I go to your house and you change things, because you know I'm coming, but when I leave, you go back to what you were doing. 
That's not good. But when we refuse to be offended by God's Word and allow God's Word to change us, then we can operate in the power of the substance of God's Word. See, this morning, and I believe that, that a lot of you are struggling, a lot of us may be struggling with seeing the value of what you hold. The power of God's Word will radically change your marriage. The power of God's Word will radically change your life. I, I remember when, when, when Dr. Norby, I, I came to him and I asked him one time about counseling. And he gave me some suggestions. He said, but the first thing that I ask, he said, are you saved? He said, if you're counseling somebody and you ask them if they're saved, if they're not saved and you lead them to the Lord, then a lot of their problems, you won't have to worry about counseling. Come on. That's power of the Word. I mean, that's wisdom, isn't it, Dr. Norby? That's wisdom whenever we understand that the Word of God changes people's lives. We don't. See, I could counsel you till you're blue in the face, but if you're not saved, everything I'm saying is going, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I mean, it's like when my son or Justice tries to talk to me about all this computer stuff. All I say is, how much is it going to cost? Because <laughs> they can tell me till they're blue in the face. For me, I don't, I, don't, I don't understand all those terminologies. I don't understand all those things. All I want to know is what's the bottom line and what's it going to do and how's it going to help. The details I have a hard time with. But you know what? Those that are in IT, my son's an IT guy, for him, he, the details are important. And he gets it. The same thing with us. When we ask Christ in our life, the details of his word changes our life because God reveals what he wants through those things by the power of the Holy Spirit. When you're saved, I'm a believer. You get the package. I'm a believer that the Holy Spirit begins to convict us, begins to reveal things to us that we would normally would have never saw before in our life. Get behind me, Satan. Matthew says in another place, for offense must come, but woe to those. Another place that talks about ministry. He says, we give no offense to anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, tribulation. See, if you're here this morning and you think that you might not never go through something, somebody's been teaching the wrong gospel to you. I wish I could tell you once you save, all your problems would go away. I will tell you this, that once you are saved, you have a person to give you problems to. And he knows much more what to do with them than anyone else. The power of his word. Here's a part that you've got to see also. If you want to really operate in the power of God's word, then you have to learn how to repent. See, salvation, there is no salvation without repentance. There's no salvation without the blood of the Lamb. There's no salvation. Listen, but once we're saved, there will be times where we make bad choices. It doesn't mean that you're not saved anymore. It means that God gives us an opportunity to repent. We're going to take the Lord's Supper in just a moment. And every time before we take it, the request is this. If you have anything in your life, get it right. If we learn to repent, now to repent means to turn away from and turn to God. See, sometimes people want to just repent and operate what we call under greasy grace and think that they can go back and do whatever they want to do. I think that's just foolish teaching. I believe that when we truly repent, we repent for what we've done wrong because God reveals it to us and we see it for what it is. Listen, what if you just repented because you got caught? 
What if you just, you were married and all of a sudden your spouse cheats on you and your spouse comes to you like, oh, I caught you cheating on me. I'm so sorry. But they don't never give up. They're, they're cheating. And I don't know about you, but that's not a good marriage. It don't take somebody who's been married 36 years to figure that out. You know what? When we repent, we turn away from and we turn back to because the level of conviction that comes on us is through the power of God's Word because God's Word says that's wrong. From the time Jesus began to preach, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Oh, listen, folks. You know some of the hardest people to win are good people? But there will be good people in hell if they hadn't repented. You might not like what I'm saying this morning. It might not fit into your doctrine. But I promise you, if you read God's Word, you'll see it. And it will change your life. We have to learn to repent, ask for forgiveness. God does it. In one place he says, repent therefore and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Some of the sweetest moments I've ever had in my life is when that level of conviction has fallen on me through God's word. And I said, God, I'm sorry. God, I repent. See, sometimes we think because we have children, we're the father of the home. When we do something wrong, we're too big to repent. Anytime I felt like I had done something wrong with my boys when they were younger, even now, I'm, I'm going to say I'm sorry. I repent. Why? Because I want them to see that, you know what, no matter who you are and what level you are, when you do something wrong, God's repentance is for you and for us and for all of us. The repentance of God's word will give you the power to change your life. And the last thing is simply this. If we're going to operate and treat God's word with the great respect that it is, and we're going to operate under the power of God's word, then we have to be doers of God's word. See, we can talk about things all day long, but if you're not willing to do it, then you just... I, I, let me read it to you. How about that? Do not be deceived, my beloved brother. For every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes from the Father of lights. Who There is no... Let me just jump down here. Uh, verse 19. So then, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness. Um... Therefore, verse 21, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. See, God's word will save your life, will change your life. It says, with meekness, the implanted word which is able to save your souls, but be doers, but be doers, but be doers, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves for anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror for he observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he is look folks God is looking for men and women to leave this place Load it with bear. Load it for bear. Because the enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes like a roaring lion. He comes in ways we know not of. He's not going to show up in the back door with a red suit and a pitchfork. That's too easy. He's going to come in a way that the deception... It's going to cause you to go astray if you don't know the word in the power of the word. 
I remember years ago, and I don't know, this story just popped in my mind, and I probably shared it before. But years ago, we were traveling back. I was in seminary, and I was going to do a financial consulting job in New Orleans. So we had all the kids with us, and we were traveling. We let the wife and kids spend some time with mom and dad, and I was going to go down to New Orleans and do this job. And back then, I-49 was not open. And so you still had to take the highway up through Bunky, through the swamps. And we stopped in Alexandria, and we had supper. And, and I don't know why at that time, I climbed in the back of the, the, the SUV we had, and Dewey was driving. And I just said, we just need to pray. And so we started praying. We prayed to the point where the kids fell asleep, except for Caleb, who sat in the front seat with his mom. I, I was in the back with the boys, the younger ones. And got through Bunky, and, and through that little stretch, that before you hit the highway um, 190, before you get there, there's a stretch of swamp on both sides of the highway. It was dark, it was late, and Julia said, Bobby, sit up, there's something going on up here. And when we got to it, we could see a guy with a flashlight, and he was waving his flashlight. And so I put my shoes on, and I got out, and I said, sir, what's, what's the problem? And he, he was panicking. He said, they're in there, they're in there. So what do you mean? He says, they're in there. They, they, they hit my, my truck. He was driving an 18-wheeler, what they refer to as a, uh, uh, I think you call it a piggyback, when you got two trailers. Is that right, Steve, a piggyback? Two trailers on the back? And apparently the guy clipped the second trailer, or, or the car clipped the second trailer. They're in there, they're in there. And so I started looking, and I saw a car, a brand-new uh, Mustang was in the swamp. And when I got to the car, there was no one in it. And I noticed in front of the car was a lady. And so I went to the front, and I said, I was trying to, to talk to her, and she, her eyes opened, but she couldn't speak. And, and, and I could feel, I, I'm telling you this on a personal experience, you can believe it or not, but I could feel like a heaviness. I mean, I could just feel like, for lack of a better way of saying it, it just felt like a, almost like a, a death angel, so to speak, or whatever you want to call it. It felt like a heaviness. And I'm, I'm, I'm not no paramedic. I didn't know how to do anything. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and says, do what you do best. And begin to speak the word and pray. And so through that, I'm, I'm just kind of talking to her, and I'm, I'm, she's there, and, and I'm trying to condole her. And, and I just said, Father, in Jesus' name, God, I don't know her circumstance. God, I don't know who she is. But God, I know you, and you are powerful, God. And God, I pray. And I mean, I begin to pray. And while I'm praying, she gasped, and she closed her eyes. And I realized that she had passed. And when I looked for the other, whoever else was in there, and there was another lady. By the time I got to her, she was no life left in her at all. And I came out, and of course, called 911, and they called, and an ambulance show. We stayed and waited, and I directed them where they were and stuff. And I left there, and I'm thinking to myself, God, what was that? I mean, I just felt like so helpless. And all of a sudden, I realized, they tell me that the hearing is one of the last things to go when someone dies. And I don't know this lady, and I wouldn't know her. I don't even remember her name. But you know what? I don't know. I don't know if me, by speaking the power of God's word, she heard God's word. I don't know if she had an opportunity to repent before she died. I don't know. I'm not trying to say these things happen, but I do know this. God's word never returns void. And God will place us in divine appointments if we believe he directs our steps. And that particular day, for whatever reason, that's where I was. Whatever happened, I do not know. But I'm telling you right now, when we speak the word of the Father, understanding the power of God's word, the enemy has to flee. Fathers, speak the word of God over your home. Mothers, if you're the spiritual leader in your home, begin to speak the word of the Lord over your home. I'm telling you right now, some of us need to go home and begin to proclaim the word of the Lord over our houses and just say, Satan, you have no dominion here. 
You have no power here. You're nothing. Because God tells me through his word that greater is the God that dwells inside of me than he's in the world. And I believe it. I trust it. And I begin to proclaim it. Father, we pray this morning for every man, woman, and child in this place. God, I don't know what they stand in need of. God, I don't know what they're going through. God, I don't know, but you do. You know the hearts of every man. Father, you said if we abide in you and your word abides in us, God, there's nothing impossible that we can ask that you wouldn't receive, that you couldn't give. So, Father, we come right there, this moment, this time, heads bowed all over this place, hearts are crying out to God. Maybe you came this morning. Maybe you're here for the first time. Maybe you've been coming. It doesn't matter. Maybe you heard the word of the Lord spoken today in such a profound way that something spoke to you. Maybe something in this message today, you might simply say, Pastor, you said something today that I needed in my life. I need that to overcome offense. I need that to be a doer. I need that. I don't need to go through all of them. God knows the hearts of all of y'all. But I do want to pray with you. I do want to mix my faith with your faith. You're here this morning. Something this message spoke to you, and you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you this morning, we're not here to embarrass you or call you out. We just want to pray for you. If that's you, just raise your hand right where you're at. Just raise it, raise it, raise it, raise it, raise it, raise it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can put them down. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Just raise it and put it down. Thank you. See those hands. Anybody else? Just raise it, put it up, put it down. Father, in your mercy and in your grace, you know every hand that was raised, and you know what they need. So, God, I just ask you, I ask you with your mercy and your grace to feel every need of every hand. Father, we mix our faith together. We proclaim the word of the Lord together. God, you said with two or more, come in agreement. You're there. So, Father, we come in agreement with every hand that's raised. And God, maybe even some that could even have the energy to raise their hand. Satan, you have no dominion over them, no life over them. You got to go in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you showed up today. Maybe you realized this morning that you're lost in need of a Savior. Maybe you showed up today and you realized that you're backslidden. Listen, between you and the Father, from the heart, just begin to pray, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I repent of my sins. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, save me. Jesus, redeem me. Jesus, I make you my Lord, my Savior. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe it's a prayer of rededication. I just want to pray for you this morning. If that's you, just slip, slip up your hand. You can put it up. You can put it down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? Thank you, Father. God, my prayer is for every hand that was lifted, that you touch their lives. God, if they're saved for the very first time, God, I pray you get them plugged in. God, I pray if this is not the place for them, that you put them in the right church. God, if they're here this morning, you want them here, then God, you get them plugged in. Father, if someone came today and maybe they've been running, backslidden, God, I pray today that you change your life. And God, we honor you with your word. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you receive that word, let's give God a hand. Amen.